Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, Meet a Space Professional Speaker Series. It's been some time, but we're excited to have you join us. Um, before we get started, a reminder that this event is being recorded and uh, you can tune in on our YouTube channel to catch this and previous uh, talks that we have hosted. Um, we would like to take this moment to uh, acknowledge the various indigenous lands that we reside on as an organization. Uh, Indispace is um, based out of the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, we welcome you to this program called Chase the Moon series that is a collaboration between Indispace, uh, Astro STEM Labs and the Ontario Regional of Malayali Association. Um, we invite you to visit the website to learn more about this fun program that has been all about moon exploration. And we want to thank the Canadian Space Agency for supporting this initiative. Uh, you can follow us on our various social media platforms if you want to learn more about our programming and the different activities that we are always uh, hosting. Um, we will do some virtual introductions to our students who are in the room. We invite you to use the Zoom chat to tell us a little bit more about yourself, like your grade level, um, what is a fascinating aspect of engineering or of the moon in general? Um, where are you tuning in from? So be sure to uh, write that in our Zoom chat um, and uh, let us know. Um, we want to mention that if you do have questions, we invite you to add them on to our Slido link. So if you go into slido.com and use the hashtag space talks, that's the code, you can write it in there. And um, we will, at the end of our guest uh, talk, we will tune into those questions and, and hear all the answers, the exciting answers. A um, couple of ground rules just to um, keep in mind. We ask that you listen closely definitely ask questions if you're curious or confused on what's being mentioned. Um, keep your questions uh, to related to the topic that is being presented, but last but not least, have a lot of fun as you learn more about this topic in space exploration. Today, we're very excited to have Dr. Jamil Sharif um, from MDA join us. He's going to talk about the Lunar Gateway mission and how it connects uh, us to the moon, Mars, and beyond. A little bit about our guest. Uh, he hails from Edmonton, Alberta. He has a bachelor's in engineering physics from UBC and a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Toronto. Uh, as part of his PhD thesis, fun fact, he lived and worked in Antarctica for three months. Uh, and he was part of an international team of scientists. He helped design, assemble, test, and launch an experiment called SPIDER on a high altitude helium balloon into the stratosphere. Very exciting. Um, throughout his career, his interests have been at the intersection of science and technology, how new developments in hardware, instrumentation, and algorithms can enable new discoveries about our natural world, and he has joined the MDA, um, which is Canada's premier space technology company back in 2019. So I will stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Dr. Sharif. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, and thanks so much for the introduction and for having me here today. Uh, I will just share my presentation. If you'll bear with me for a moment. Okay, great. Hopefully that's working now. So uh, as was said before, I'm going to be talking about a new space station orbiting the moon, which um, is the gateway to Mars and beyond. And I want to thank all the partner organizations uh, represented there for inviting me to speak here today. 
I thought I would start though by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I don't usually give too much personal background on these talks, but I thought since it is somewhat uh, relevant given the partner organizations involved, I would mention that I am of Indian uh, descent. Originally, my grandparents were born in uh, Gujarat in Northern India, and then my parents were born and grew up in East Africa, and then I was born in Canada. Uh, more specifically in Edmonton, Alberta, as was mentioned. And my first degree was in engineering and physics combined. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with uh, that degree and those skills. And I sort of ended up in a couple of internships uh, that guided me towards this idea that was mentioned in, in the intro about me of um, developing the new technology that enables new discoveries. So it's sort of a hands-on uh, hardware oriented approach to science where you're actually building machines that can hopefully tell us something fundamental uh, about the universe. So that's why after my first degree in engineering, uh, I decided to pursue a PhD in astronomy, uh, which as many of you may know, is the study of sort of what's out there in the universe. And here's a picture of me uh, as part of that PhD research in Antarctica. This photo was taken on January 1st, 2015. And I'm standing in front of SPIDER, the set of balloon-borne telescopes uh, that was mentioned before that our team of university researchers from around the world designed and built. And this is on the day of the launch. And the goal of SPIDER was to measure uh, what you see on the right-hand side there. So that oval is like a map. So imagine that it's like, uh, a world map where you take the globe and you unfold it into a flat piece of paper. This is the same idea, except that this is a map of the night sky. Uh, and it's not even a map that we can see with our eyes. It's what the night sky would look like if we could see radio waves or microwaves to be more specific. And so what this map is saying is that, you know, in some places it's brighter and some places it's dimmer, but there are radio waves coming at us from all directions on the sky. And it might seem very mysterious, but actually this is the oldest light that we can see coming to us from the furthest distances that we can see out to in space. So beyond all the most distant galaxies, we see this light that is actually the glow left over from the heat of the Big Bang. So this is sort of like a baby picture of the universe. It tells us what it was like very close to the beginning. And the, the job of SPIDER was to make the most detailed picture of that that we've ever made in the hopes of kind of telling us a little bit more about what happened in the very first moments of, of the Big Bang, of the creation of the universe. So that's what my PhD was about. And uh, I love talking about that. I love talking about that branch of astrophysics, which is called cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole. And I love talking about my trip to Antarctica and telescopes. So if you have any questions about that at the end, uh, I'd love to put on my astronomer hat and, and answer them. But for today, uh, today's theme and the theme of this whole lecture series is lunar exploration. So today I thought we would put on our engineering hats or our explorer hats and talk a little bit more about a project that I've been involved in that I've been very lucky to be involved in more recently. And that is called the Lunar Gateway. This is like the next step in the human exploration of space where we actually venture out there. So what the Lunar Gateway is, is it's a planned new space station that we are going to build that will be in orbit around the moon. So it doesn't exist yet. What you're looking at here is like a computer artist's vision of that. But when it's finished being constructed, it'll be the most distant, like permanent outpost that humanity has ever built. And, and to give you a sense of just how distant, uh, here we have the Earth. And right now, we already have a space station uh, in low Earth orbit, about 400 kilometers up called the International Space Station, the ISS. Now imagine you were to go out a thousand times farther away than that. 
that's where the moon would be. Obviously, I'm not showing that correctly here or it wouldn't fit on the slide, but that's the basic idea is that we're going to go out a thousand times farther than the existing space station and pick an orbit around the moon that's sort of this elongated oval shape and put the new space station out there. So much like the ISS, the Lunar Gateway will be assembled from individual pieces, individual spacecraft that all connect to each other or dock together to form the whole thing. Uh, you can sort of see the two, the ISS and the proposed Lunar Gateway side by side here. And you can see that unlike the ISS, the Lunar Gateway is going to be quite a bit smaller because the idea is that it's a little bit more specialized. It's a little bit more focused in what it does. And I'm gonna get into what it does uh, later. But first here is uh, the whirlwind tour of the Lunar Gateway. So what are these modules that make it up? So first of all, there would be a module, a spacecraft for power and propulsion, meaning that would have the main rocket engines used to maneuver the Gateway. That's called the PPE. And that's a module that's being provided by the United States, by NASA, right? And then in addition to that, there would also be another module. You can see that it has antennas on it because it's a European Space Agency module for communications and also for refueling. And then on top of that, there would be at least two modules that are actually pressurized, meaning that they have air inside them uh, so that they could serve as a, a habitat, as a place where astronauts would be able to live and work. Uh, while on the Lunar Gateway. So I should mention that this graphic, this, this cartoon of Lunar Gateway is a bit old. So the concepts for all these modules are actually quite a bit farther along now. So I'd really encourage you to go uh, on the internet, Google uh, some of these modules. You can look up the HALO module, the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, which is one of the habitats being provided by NASA. And then you can also look up the IHAB, the International Habitat, which is again, a European space agency module. It's under development by them and it will be provided by them. So you can see that just like with the ISS, international cooperation is really important because there's no one country or organization that has the funding, the money and the resources to do all this on their own. And then finally, the last uh, spacecraft in the, the stack here uh, is showing how from time to time, uh, there could be visiting spaceships uh, that could arrive at the gateway to bring new crew members and new supplies to the space station. And the one that's being shown here is the concept for a new kind of spacecraft called Orion, which is the next generation sort of crewed spacecraft um, capsule uh, that's being developed by NASA. And it's specifically designed for deep space exploration. So the idea here is that Orion could be docked at the gateway and then from time to time, astronauts, if they were there, they could take it out for a joyride and they could sort of, you know, go on runs that are venture out progressively farther and farther away from the gateway. And I think this gets at really the main reason why we want to build a space station in lunar orbit in the first place. It's because we've never had a permanent presence out that far before. So unlike in the 1960s, where we just visited the moon, this is the goal here is to kind of establish a permanent human presence where we would have people living and working out there in deep space, far regular supply lines and regular communication, because we're going to, if we're ever going to embark on a human Mars mission. And a human Mars mission is a situation where you could have astronauts out there for years at a time with no, no new supplies and very like poor and delayed communication with Earth. So they're all out there on their own. Their mission has to be self-contained. And the gateway is where we get the practice figuring out how to do that. So the gateway is really, really far away. It's remote by design, right? For exactly the reason I just said. But because of that remoteness, um, that presents some challenges of its own. For one thing, for most of the year, for, for all but one month out of the year, the gateway isn't even going to have a human crew. It's just gonna be empty. So it needs to operate by itself and maintain itself. And this is where sort of the state-of-the-art Canadian technology comes in. So Canada's contribution to the Lunar Gateway is an advanced new robotic system, a set of robots that is called Canadarm3. And it's called that because this is the third Canadarm uh, that has been produced. The first Canadarm 
was the one attached to the space shuttle. So I don't know if you are too young to remember, but the space shuttle is just that white uh, orbiter that was like the first reusable spacecraft that would, you could launch into orbit on a rocket and then it could fly back down to the Earth and land on a runway like a plane. And it operated from 1980 to 2011 and it had the Canon arm, the only one at the time, attached to it to help it launch satellites and payloads and repair things uh, and even carry astronauts. The Canon arm two, uh, the second uh, version, the sequel, is the one that is attached to the International Space Station right now. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But the Canon Arm 3 is what we are planning to have attached to the Lunar Gateway. Again, it doesn't exist yet. It's under development, but it brings some new features that have never been seen before. So I'm really excited to tell you about those features. First of all, here's like the quick tour again of Canon Arm 3. So it actually consists of a large robotic arm that's really powerful and does all the heavy lifting and has a long reach. And then there's kind of a smaller arm that's capable of doing like it has the dexterity to do finer scale repair work around the outside of the space station. And then there's a whole set of special tools and adapters that attach to the ends of the arms that enable them to do a wide variety of different tasks, depending on what the specific mission is. So the Canon Arm 3 is kind of like a general purpose handy repair person and Swiss Army knife of the, of the Lunar Gateway. And that's actually really important um, because as you can see here, some of the uses of Canon Arm 3 might include uh, reaching out and grabbing a visiting spacecraft and bringing it, bringing it in to dock to the space station, especially for spacecraft that don't have the ability to dock by themselves. Another important role for Canon Arm 3 is actually building and reorganizing, rearranging the gateway itself. So, you know, taking a module, undocking it and moving it to another location. Then of course, as I mentioned, there's the, the critical role of carrying out automated repairs on the outside of the space station. So replacing broken components like replacing solar panels or batteries uh, with new ones, for example. And this is actually really key. This is, this is crucial because what that does is it allows the number of spacewalks that astronauts have to go on uh, on the outside of the space station to do those repairs to be reduced a lot because instead of having a potentially expensive and risky astronaut spacewalk or EVA uh, to do those repairs, you can just have the robot uh, do them instead. So that's a huge advantage. Now, the flip side of that is that if a spacewalk is necessary, the CanArm 3 can support that. It can actually carry an astronaut on the end of the arm and transport her or him to where, wherever they need to go. So just to kind of summarize that, I thought I would show you this animation. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize that this is sped up. The robots don't move this fast in real life. But here's the large arm unloading some cargo and putting it, installing it on the outside of the space station. And here it is putting a special tool back into storage. Now this is my favorite actually mode of operating where the arm actually walks end over end. So the tip, attaches and becomes the base. The base detaches, becomes the tip. And then once again, the tip will attach and become the base and the base will become the tip. So the, the large arm can sort of inchworm its way across the outside of the lunar gateway in order to get to where it needs to go. And then here using a special tool, the large arm is swapping out a damaged component uh, that it will replace with a new one later. So I hope that kind of helped like illustrate what I've been saying, uh, you know, in terms of the how useful Canon Arm 3 is. But so far, all I've shown you is just like fancy computer graphics, right? So where, where does the knowledge and experience uh, come from to build these things and who's going to build them? Well, I, I think it's no surprise who's going to build them, but uh, I just wanted to show you um, what we have already achieved. Just kind of give you some background, right? So this is not a computer animation. This is an actual photograph that was taken from space, uh, from low Earth orbit, uh, from the International Space Station. And it's a picture of the two robots that, like I mentioned, are attached to the outside of the ISS. There's a Canon Arm 2, and then there's Dexter hanging out on the end of Canon Arm 2. And I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say uh, so first of all, I should mention both of these robots designed and built uh, by MDA, the company that I work for. 
And, and like I was saying, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that without these two robots uh, having been in operation for as long as they have, we would have not have been able to build the ISS uh, to keep it running all this time, uh, or even to use it as a platform for launching satellites and science experiments. So these robots are really critical. Canon Arm 2 has been up there operating since 2001 and Dexter since 2008. And, you know, I don't know if anybody uses paper money anymore, so you may not even have realized this, but uh, because of that, because of how important these uh, hardware systems are, um, they're actually featured on the back of our currencies, right? That's an all Canadian in invention, right? And so I, I think that really speaks to the legacy that Canada has of, of creating these sorts of systems uh, that really enhance our ability to live and work um, in low earth orbit and now in the future in lunar orbit. Now, what's, what's new here or what's needed to be new for Canada Arm 3, you might be wondering. Well, actually the large arm and the small arm of Canada Arm 3 uh, have very similar jobs or roles on the gateway uh, that the existing Canada Arm 2 and Dexter already have or fulfill on, on the ISS. The main difference is automation. So right now, Canada Arm 2, the way it's operated is that it has to be piloted. It has the end of it has to be flown around by an operator using a joystick. It's like playing a video game. So that could either be astronauts on the space station or ground operators now can do it too. Um, but there needs to be a human in control. Whereas with Canada Arm 3, like I said before, there may not be any humans there. So Canada Arm 3 has to operate and move around by itself. And that's the big like, engineering and technology challenge that we're facing at MDA, how to take what Canada Arm 2 can already do and make that completely autonomous. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're all really excited at the company to be taking on those sorts of challenges and helping really facilitate the future of space exploration. Uh, I just wanted to end off by like recapping again, now that we've sort of gone over why, how Canada Arm 3 is so critical to the Lunar Gateway, I wanted to recap again why the Lunar Gateway in the first place, where it sort of fits in in the big picture. And you can see that it sort of fits into this three-step approach uh, to exploring the solar system that NASA and the other international space agencies have been taking. It's like a, it's like a careful step-by-step -step approach where we've We've been building up our capabilities and what we can do in low earth orbit. And now we're gonna build up our capability in, uh, it says there, cis lunar space, which is the space between the earth and the moon. Again, to get that practice of living and working in deep space quite far away from earth, certainly farther away than we've ever been before. And then after that, once we have those capacities and those abilities, it's on to Mars, right? So step-by-step step in the gateway, you know, is a key, in a key position to sort of make that whole exploration program happen. So the gateway actually could be an outpost for lots of different things. It could be an outpost for doing space science. So for example, that's like astrophysics, again, the study of the universe and stars and galaxies and, and black holes and all that. Um, it could also be uh, space science like heliophysics, the study of the sun, or geology and geophysics, the study of how planetary objects form and evolve over time, or particle physics, the study of like things that are smaller than atoms and, and how they um, sort of exist in the space environment. And then space medicine, what, what effects, does, uh, what effects uh, does being in space for prolonged periods have on the human body? So all of that science uh, is, is really important and something that the Gateway will help us to do. But over and above that, uh, the Gateway, as I mentioned, is a place where we develop new technology uh, capacity. So these are the things, uh, the automatic operations that I mentioned, automatic, automated docking, automated assembly, automated maintenance. We're going to need to be able to do all of these things if we're going to venture out into the solar system for years at a time. And then, of course, the gateway could be uh, something that helps us perfect the art of surface exploration, because the gateway makes a great uh, launching point for um, not only 
human astronauts uh, visiting the surface of the moon, but also robotic explorers like rovers visiting the surface of the moon. Uh, it gives us access to the south pole of the moon. It gives us access to the far side. And that might actually help us understand more about what the surface of the moon is made out of, what resources are there, what minerals are there, and therefore like what, which of those materials we could make use of on future missions where we can't take all the materials and resources we need with us. So we're going to have to make use of what's already there in order to survive and work on the surface of the moon. So the gateway really helps enable that. And then understanding space weather, uh, it's just again, what is the environment like in the space between the Earth and the moon so far away from Earth? We haven't really measured that. How much radiation is there? Uh, how many meteoroids or micro meteoroids are there? So for those of you who don't know, these are just like small bits of rock and debris floating around in the solar system, and they can hit your spacecraft at high speed and damage it, even, maybe even catastrophically. So we need to understand, you know, what is the rate of impact of those, of those meteoroids out there in the locations we're planning to explore. So there's a lot to do and a lot to learn. So I just want to cap it all off by showing you um, another animation, a computer animation of these advanced Canadian robotics on the outside of the Lunar Gateway. And now uh, the robots are actually moving at a more lifelike speed. So they, they move, like I said, much more slowly than I showed you in the first animation. But here's an example of uh, one of the scenarios I was telling you about where a spacecraft is coming in, it's visiting the Gateway, right? And uh, the large arm may be detecting it automatically uh, reaches out to sort of grapple onto it, grab it, um, capture it, and bring it in closer to the space station. Um, it could be bringing it in for docking, but in, in this case, I think in this video, this is a spacecraft that has returned from the surface of the moon with some samples of the soil, and so the large arm is holding that spacecraft in position so that the small arm can reach out and grab the sample container. And I just wanted to end off by saying the mission duration for the gateway uh, is something like 15 years at a minimum, maybe even 20 or 30. So these are the kinds of exploration hardware robotic systems that people like you could be working on in the future if you choose to get into a, a STEM, a science, technology, engineering, and math field like this that is associated with space exploration. So it, the, what the, whatever the future holds, I, I'm sure that it's really exciting and that there are so many opportunities to be involved as humanity ventures out uh, to explore the stars. So thank you so much for, for having me. Um, again, I, I, I wanted to keep it hopefully somewhat short and sweet and so that I would have time to answer all of your questions. So I'm really eager to do that. And thanks once again. Uh Thank you. I think uh, I was I was uh, in awe of all the animations that were showcasing yeah. what's yet to come. So it's very exciting to see that. Um, if you don't mind actually uh, stopping your share screen, I can pull up the questions. Um, um, we have had a range of questions come in from all of us in attendance. Uh, and so to everyone, if you, while I pull this up, if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question live, we welcome that as well. And, and uh, if not, I'll, I'll dive into what I see in front of me, but I'll also share my screen. So uh, one second. Uh, yes, I believe you can now see this. Yeah. So quite a few uh, questions if you want to start from the top. Uh, what was your best internship memory? Uh, there's maybe two. Um, the first one is uh, I had a, what's called a co-op internship, which is where um, it's a required part of your university uh, courses um, that the university pairs you up with a company or a research lab in the, in the real world and you get some experience working, right? So I was working at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory uh, in Northern Ontario, uh, which is deep underground in a mine shaft, uh, because the measurements that it was trying to do of um, particles, neutrinos uh, emanating from the sun and from other places in space uh, can only be done down there. So really amazing memory of traveling 
down to the, I think it was 6,800 foot level of that mine. So something like two kilometers underground and then trekking across the tunnel uh, just as a, as a student, as a university student intern. Um, but, uh, you know, it, very unique experience really made me realize that physics is not just about drawing equations on a blackboard. You know, the experimental side of it is building really big, complicated machines in really interesting places in the world. And that mm -hmm. set me on the path that I, you know, for the rest of my career from, from spider in Antarctica to MDA. So uh, yeah, actually I'll leave it there. That's my, my best internship memory, I would say. Cool. Um, now a question about the gateway, when will it be ready? Great question. Um, the first modules uh, are the PPE and the HALO that I mentioned, the US modules that I think are scheduled to launch now no earlier than 2025, or it might be late 2024, the schedule keeps changing, but that will kick things off. And then I think that, um, I think that subsequent modules that are already under development, like IHAB um, and uh, various logistics modules for carrying supplies, um, including one being developed by SpaceX, uh, will follow in short order. So really it's the, it's the realm of the mid to the late 2020s uh, over which the gateway will be constructed. Yeah, that's the timeline. Okay. Um, ha have you been to space? And if not, would you want to? <laughs> that's a great question. I, um, I always wanted to growing up. I wanted to be an astronaut like many kids, but probably like many of the, the, the attendees of the talk today. And uh, I, I, the most exciting adventure I had, I ultimately went sort of more of the scientist route than the explorer route. But the science I was doing, you know, again, uh, you know, allowed me to go down to Antarctica the, and the most extreme environment on Earth and was there for three months. Uh, I actually did just sort of more to see what would happen and for fun, apply to the, the CSA astronaut recruitment drive that ha happened in 2016. And, uh, you know, they said your application, although very interesting, was not quite as good as these other 600 people who advanced instead of you. So that's that's how it goes, you know, like, uh, you, you know, with, when you apply to be an astronaut, um, there are going to be thousands or, of applicants and they whittle it down to a handful, right? Um, but I, I think that if in the future, to actually answer the question, space travel becomes more accessible to ordinary people like space tourism and actually becomes affordable and safe, then I'd love to do it. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go on a one-way trip or anything uh, to explore Mars, but I would love to at least... Uh, travel into low earth orbit and see see the planet that is our home that would be amazing indeed well you're you're getting closer to it because you know launches are happening and space yeah. tourism is slowly starting so yeah. um okay how fast does the arm actually work yeah that's a great question so it, it works more along the lines of that last video i showed you the flashier one with better graphics but basically um, the tip of the arm, especially the large arm, will only move uh, in one second, it'll, it'll only move a few centimeters. So that gives you a sense of kind of the, the, the speed that's involved. And the reason behind that is just um, because the arm could be carrying a load that is thousands of kilograms, you know, and, and so if you, if you try to accelerate something so heavy, like this is some, some basic physics you might be getting into the older kids in, in the audience, but if you try to accelerate something so heavy uh, at, up to, you know, at, at, such a, at such a high rate, you're going to end up putting a lot of strain on the arm. That, the end of the arm is gonna see a lot of force. So in order to sort of keep the forces that the arm has to withstand down to a manageable level so it doesn't break, uh, you keep those rates low. And so that's some basic like uh, engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, considerations for you there that, that kind of determine why we move a little bit more slowly than you might think. Yeah. Okay. Um, can the gateway be used for missions to other planets? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think that given the proximity to the moon, it could certainly be used for missions to the lunar surface, like I said. Um, but I, like I also said at the beginning of the talk, it's a fairly small space station that's fairly focused in what it does. So sending, the, sending all the material that you would need for an interplanetary voyage up to the gateway 
uh, and then parking it there um, sort of doesn't really make sense because you still have to expend all the rocket fuel to get all that material off Earth's surface. And so if you're going to do that, you might as well just send the voyage out <laughs> on the interplanetary voyage in the first place. So I think that um, it's, it's not so much a physical stepping stone to, to other planets as it is a, a techno, like I said, a technological stepping stone where we develop the experience and the capacities we need in order to be able to do those more complicated future missions. Um, a simple one, what's your favorite planet? Oh, great question. Um, I guess it comes down to, do we mean planet in our solar system or do we mean like one of the 5,000 planets that have been discovered elsewhere in the Milky Way, right? Because that's the amazing thing that modern astronomy has taught us, which is that our solar system is not the only star system in the galaxy. There's, just, there's at least you know, thousands of other planets out there. And so I, I would, although I would say Saturn probably for, for our solar system, and then, you know, for extrasolar planets, exoplanets, I would say there's these really cool things called hot Jupiters, where it's something mm -hmm. like the size of Jupiter, a gas giant, um, but it's orbiting closer into its star than Mercury orbits to our sun. So this Jupiter is really hot because it's really, really close to its star. And that star is actually evaporating all the gases off that gas giant. So that's like a crazy thing that we would never have conceived of before we started looking for planets. So Saturn and hot Jupiters is my answer. Cool. Um, so I guess back to Gateway, will it be specifically designed to launch rovers or robots or is it more a possibility for future development? Yeah, um, so that's um, something that keeps changing um, as kind of the scope of the, uh, the, the Artemis program, which is the, the, the new version of Apollo. Um, so the program to send human astronauts, um, including the first woman uh, to the surface of the moon. Um, so the Artemis program was originally like fully integrated with Gateway, where Gateway would definitely have the, um, the lander docked to it and send it down to the surface and bring it back up. And so that has been kind of like up in the air, like it's changed the mission profile where I think the, the first Artemis mission that uh, lands ast astronauts, crew members on the surface of the moon might just sort of go directly to the moon. But in the future, uh, again, because we've been thinking about this and building, in, build, building it in to the capabilities of the gateway, um, vehicles that are docked to the gateway and travel to the surface and come back up, that's part of the, the mission that's envisioned for, for the gateway for sure, yeah. Oh, so is it just one rover at a time, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so, yeah. Okay, um, Okay, and then <laughs> uh, how large is the gateway? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, you're putting me on the spot with that one. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have a number, um, but you remember that graphic I showed you at the beginning where it was comparing uh, the, the lunar gateway um, to uh, to the, the International Space Station side by side, right? And the, the the International Space Station, I know the like the floor area of it, if you if you like, including the solar panels, is really large. It's like the size of a football field, right? And then so if you take if you look at that graphic and you see the gateways, maybe like half the length of that or something. So that gives you a rough you know ballpark figure of, of what the dimensions are. But again, that was kind of an old graphic. So I would encourage you um, to, to follow up, do, do some research and say, okay, how big are each of the new modules and the, the latest designs of them uh, in order to get yet uh, a more up-to-date answer, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> finally, on the, the astronomical note, <laughs> do you think aliens are real is the question. <laughs> uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a big loaded question. Um, it's funny, uh, as a scientist, uh, this is where I have to answer cautiously and say we have no evidence for the existence of aliens so far, right? Um, certainly, I don't think that the accounts of aliens like actually having visited Earth already uh, are that believable, right? Um, so in that sense, like aliens um, 
as described by accounts of people who say they've seen unidentified flying objects or even um, claim that they were abducted. I, I feel like those accounts may not be the most believable, but do I think a like extraterrestrial life in general exists in the universe? I would say there's, even without any evidence, there's just a really, really high like probability that it life must have developed somewhere else. And the reason why I say that is because this is, you know, our planet is just one planet, you know, orbiting around one star mm -hmm. and our galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. Like it's such a big number. You can't even imagine how big that is, right? Hundreds of billions of stars in it, right? And we've established through our observations of planets, you know, around stars other than our own, that it's pretty common for star systems to have planets, right? And then when you, so, so there, there could be like thousands, millions, uh, even more habitable planets just in our galaxy alone. And then there's the question of, you know, you know, life could look very different than it does here. So what, what, we, what we describe as being habitable conditions may be too narrow of a way of looking at it. There could be some really weird life. Mm -hmm. There already is some really weird life that exists in some very extreme environments on Earth, right? And so you take those hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy and you multiply that by hundreds of billions of galaxies just in the known universe, just in the part of the universe that we can see, right? And, you know, you end up with such a, uh, you know, pun fully intended, astronomically high number of stars that could potentially harbor planets, that could potentially harbor life, that I would say that life, you know, there, the chances of life having developed elsewhere in the universe seem really high to me, even if that life is so far away that we'll never, ever encounter it. Uh, it you know, it's nice, it's nice to think that it's very unlikely we're alone. There's got to be something else out there. Um, that is at least like sentient and aware of its environment and maybe even intelligent and able to ask questions the way we do about mm -hmm. why we are here and what is the universe like. So that's my answer to that one. I think, I think well put, <laughs> diplomatically, uh, yeah, <laughs> considered. Um, okay, I think my, so no more questions. So again, to anyone who wants to add another question, go ahead. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask my question. Um, mm -hmm. So do you, so we know from the space station here, it does, you know, an orbit and it kind of sees um, sunrises many times in a day. Um, any guesses on uh, on whether the gateway would be able to see something similar, like a, a moon rise or a sunrise or even an earth rise? Is that possible? Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. I'd have to think about that a little bit. So um, because the orbit of the ISS is um, relatively close to the Earth, um, it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. And that's why you get sunrises mm -hmm. and sunsets so often. Mm -hmm. But the, the orbit of the gateway is very different. It's that long oval um, where okay. you know one end of it is pretty close to the moon, but then the other end of it goes way out 75,000 kilometers or something above the, the lunar surface. Sure. And so the, there's, there's lots of reasons for that. One is so that you spend a lot of time hanging out over the lunar south polar region. So you can, you have a lot of opportunity to, again, deploy experimental rovers to that region. Um, but then another reason for that is that that orbit, um, the direction it faces rotates like this, okay? So that you're always kind of facing, the, the, the face of the orbit is always kind of towards Earth. So you can imagine that you're going around the moon, but from your point of view, the moon never blocks your sight line to Earth, right? So you're not going to have you're not going to have an eclipse where the moon is blocking your view of Earth most of the time, and that's by design so that you can communicate directly. Um, so that's one one uh, sort of thing, like along the lines of uh, uh, sunrise, sunset that like we've ruled out, right? But there could be other con like um, configurations, like arrangements that I'm not thinking of right now. But basically, that's how the orbit's set up. It's it's like actual thought was put into it to say like, no, you pretty much haven't a clear, like unblocked view of Earth all the time, which is kind of neat, yeah. Cool, yeah. So is the closer part of the orbit uh, near the South Pole of the moon? Yeah, it's actually the other way around. So the, the farther part of the orbit is, is, is what hovers over the South Pole. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and the reason for that is just um, 
it's um it's sort of basic physics like if you're if you're falling um as you get closer to the thing you're falling towards you move faster so at the mm -hmm. close end of the orbit you just whiz around the moon but at True. the far end of the orbit you, you you're moving you're more slowly down. yeah so you spend a lot of time hovering over that south pole even though you're very far away from it and that gives you an ideal like opportunity to send things down there yeah Cool. Yes, the South Pole is a very exciting place, as we yeah. we kind of know. But uh, um, that has been amazing. No more questions. So again, um, I think last call. If anyone wants to even use it on Zoom, you can, you can write your questions. But otherwise, I will take this opportunity to thank you for uh, joining us, our, our small group, and uh, yeah, sharing a lot about. The upcoming mission and and Canada's role in it. I think it's very exciting to see that. So thank you and um, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you want to leave, uh, uh, share your thoughts on how you found this talk uh, and, uh, you know, um, what has been an exciting aspect of it. I'm sure we'd love to learn more, but otherwise uh, have a good evening and we'll see you at our next event. Don't forget, we do have a lunar eclipse happening <laughs> this this weekend. So uh, nice time to go and see the moon and, and uh, think about what was shared today. So um, yeah, have a good evening and, and thanks again for joining.